All right, good morning. Amazing to see you guys. My name's uh, James. I spend most of my time down on the estate. Uh, uh, church in the same near brilliant, but it's great to come up uh, into the high air here. Just kidding. And uh, on the first set, being slightly naughty there. That's all right. Uh, and you know, what a wonderful introduction uh, we've had there. We've sung about Jesus number one. And this passage is all about Jesus number one. He has the supremacy. He is uh, the one over everything. And I won't, I won't pray for us. John's uh, praying for us because I take that, that we're still learning from Jesus. We're still like children learning from, from Jesus. And uh, uh, Jesus, he, he was a real person in history. He lived, he lived uh, many years ago. And uh, he, he said some amazing things. So Paul uh, gives the statement that about Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And uh, I gather in a group like this, we might have different views and thoughts over who Jesus is. Uh, some of us might be taking our first steps and, and thinking, who is this Jesus? I've heard about him at school a bit and maybe at Sunday school, but who is he? Who is he? Maybe we've been going on a while. Uh, and our view of Jesus is starting to, to fade a bit as, as the pressures of life uh, press in a bit there. Maybe like the Colossians, we are doing well. We're doing well in our Christian faith. And at, at the center of, of being a Christian is knowing who Jesus is, of seeing Jesus uh, clearly. So what about, what do you think? of Jesus. And uh, uh, very sadly, the people in history have got, had different views over Jesus. Uh, so some people say he's a swear word, they're using a swear word. Some, some people say he's, he's like the Easter rabbit, he's a fiction. Some Muslims say that uh, he was a prophet, but not God. And uh, they say that, uh, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. But it only appeared as if he died when Jesus died. Mormons say that he, he is a spiritual man. His, his parents were spirit, but he wasn't uh, God. Marx, Karl Marx, you probably know this one. Uh, he was an, an opiate of the masses. He was made to fool us uh, so rulers could trick us and keep us down. Jehovah's Witnesses, they think he's a powerful angel, uh, but not God. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus living a little after Jesus. He didn't believe in Jesus, uh, but he writes. And about this time, they lived Jesus, a wise man. Indeed, one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was the teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. And so he thought that Jesus was a man. Uh, uh, Benny Hinn, the famous prosperity teacher, uh, he would claim that Jesus is a spirit-filled man. But he is not God. And so we too can be like Jesus and be spirit filled and, and call these great blessings on ourselves. Uh, the fourth century heretic, Arian, he said that Jesus was created by God, but he wasn't equal to God. He wasn't the same as God always. Many would accept Jesus as a loving example, a good role model in life, but not necessarily one who we should obey in every instance. And many will say, well, you can take what he says uh, with a pinch of salt. Uh, he's simply a man bound by his location in history, but he's not speaking the words of God. And I think uh, uh, what all of those views have in common is that they deny that Jesus is a God, that Jesus is God and can't, that he is God in his fullness uh, come in flesh. So where are you? Who are you? Where are you in your thinking about Jesus? And the thing is, if we get Jesus wrong, then we get everything wrong in the Christian life. No Jesus, no life. But if we know Jesus, if we know him in his fullness, then we can know eternal life and be with him uh, for, forever. And Paul, he's, he's writing to this bunch of Christians in Colossae. It's in Turkey, maybe been to Turkey and 
on holiday. It's still standing. You can still go and look at bits of the city today. It's not as glamorous as it was. Uh, they've been losing their view of Jesus. They've been losing their vision of Jesus. They're not seeing him as clearly as they, they thought. And, and, and in some way, they're looking for fullness. The word they would have used is fullness outside of Jesus. And so Paul says, no, you find fullness of God in Jesus. You need to go to God. Uh, and so for Paul, in this little section, he wants them to see the beauty of Jesus. He wants to, them to see who Jesus is clearly, that he is God. He's, super, he's got superhuman powers. He's amazing. He's brilliant. He's like a Marvel character, but bigger and better. And so Paul, he, he sings a song. He writes a poem, uh, a poem in the section, verses 15 uh, to 20, a creed, something like where we declared our faith with. And uh, it's a song, it's a poem with two, two verses. I wonder if you spotted them, listen to them as we went through those verses there. The first verse is that Jesus rules this creation, verse 15 to 17. And then we'll see later that Jesus rules the creation that is to come, the new uh, creation. And so our plan this morning is we're going to look at those two verses and then we're going to look at a final point of what this means for us, that Jesus is our reconciler. He brings peace uh, between us and God. So Jesus rules this creation. So just look down, verse 15 in our reading. Do keep your Bibles open. Verse 15 we read, He, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And so I've got a, a brand spanking new pound coin in my pocket. There we go, there we go. Whose head is on that brand spanking new pound coin? Who, who dug it two times back, yeah? Whose head, yeah? Charles. King Charles, there's his head, there's his head, there's his head. And why is this image on it? Why is this image on it? Because he's the king. He's the one in power. He controls everything. He's the head of the church. He's the head of the government. He's the boss who rules everything. And why is his image on it? and not his brothers, Prince Andrews, because he's the firstborn. He's the one uh, with supremacy. And so we read that in verse 15, the firstborn over all creation. It speaks not so much about Jesus being born, Jesus wasn't born, but that he has power, that he's in charge, that he is the king. So Psalm 89, verse 27, we read, God speaking about his king says, and I will appoint him to be my firstborn. It's a status thing. It's a title thing of power, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. And so Jesus, and so Paul is saying that Jesus is the image of God. The firstborn, Paul is saying that Jesus rules everything. He is in charge. He's number one over everything. He is God, our creator, the firstborn over all creation. And just look there what it says at the end of verse 16. For by him, all things were created. Everything that you can think of, everything <laughs> that you can hold, everything that you aspire to have or be in life, Jesus has created. And he gives us a list of everything that Jesus rules over and creates it. And in short, it, it includes all things. Did you notice that in the reading? All things, all things, all things. And so from the very biggest things in the world, the blue whale, maybe, maybe an elephant, a huge elephant with big tusks, maybe the mountains, maybe like going up Pendle Hill. Jesus owns that. He created that. Maybe, maybe you, you like looking in a telescope when it's not cloudy and blackburn and, and looking at stars <laughs> and the planets. Jesus made all of that a couple of years ago. Some scientists, they, they thought, well, what should they do with their satellites, their, their telescope over Christmas? Because obviously no one's manning the, the telescope over Christmas. And they left it pointed at what they thought was a black bit of sky. And what they discovered was in that black bit of sky where they thought nothing was there, it was packed with galaxies. It was absolutely huge. And, and so they realized that the, ga the universe was bigger than they thought. And Jesus created that he made everything and he made us he made us too and there's not a, a thing in creation 
And so there's the big things, but he also made the small things, bacteria, atoms, electrons, uh, little blood corpuscles, uh, little things there. Jesus made everything. There's another thing in creation that Jesus doesn't say mine over. He made everything. Maybe you've seen uh, Finding Nemo when the seagull said, mine, mine, mine. Jesus says mine over everything. But it's not just uh, the creative order that Jesus says mine over. He also says he rules over the rulers of this created order. So just look at the end of verse 16. He says, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, Jesus rules over them. President Biden, Prime Minister Keir Starmer, King Charles, your MP, your local council, Jesus rules over. Don't think that means you can get off your parking ticket. Jesus rules over them. He rules over them all. All things were created by him and for him. And by for him there, he means that they find their meaning in him. They find their wholeness in him. They find their identity in him. Maybe you've been wondering what life's about. And the answer is Jesus. You find your meaning, your identity, your security in, in Jesus. And in all things, verse 17, all things in him, they hold together. You don't draw a single breath in your life, but that it's given by Jesus. Every breath is a gift from him. He sustains you. He keeps you going. He, he allows the little cells to do their energy transformation thing in your body that gives you energy to move. He allows that to happen. And so Jesus rules over everything in this creation. But it's not just that he owns this creation. He owns the creation that is to come, the new creation, verse 18 and 19. So just look down at verse 18 there. Paul writes, and he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. And so that everything he might have supremacy so i wonder if i can ask you guys what's your view of heaven what do you think heaven's like maybe you think it's angels sitting on a cloud and it's not my best picture it's not my idea of the rich but uh, a couple of years ago i went on on holiday i went to mozambique it was brilliant i got there it was a lovely beach it was a lovely beach it was fantastic my mates were there it was brilliant and then uh I picked up malaria and Lots of my bags got stolen. And uh, it went from being a paradise into being somewhere terrible. I don't want to be there. I wanted to be in a good hospital, a, a nice developed country. But imagine Mozambique without malaria, without sickness, without baddies stealing your bags. <laughs> it would be paradise. And the Bible says that's what heaven will be like. It won't be angels sitting on a cloud. It will be this world, better, but made better. This world 2.0, but without the bad things and without the nasties, without tears, everything will be better and amazing. No aphids on your tomatoes. No rain to ruin the crops. Maybe you've been to George and Clemmie's to go pick a sunflower, and there are no sunflowers because it's been raining so much this year. It will be a new creation and it will be amazing. And because it's a new creation, you're going to need a new physical body to live there. And so Jesus, Paul says that Jesus is the first person to receive this new physical body. He is the firstborn from among the dead, verse 16. And so because of that, it's like he's the explorer who's gone there. He's put the flag in the, in the ground and said, it's mine. He's the firstborn. He's got the new creation body first. He rules over the new creation too. And uh, he will be there in the new creation. Not the baddies, not the baddies, not the things that ruin this world and the people who ruin this world, but the church. 
the church, those who believe and trust in Jesus will be there. Us who are sitting here this morning who trust and believe in Jesus. We will be in that new uh, creation. And so sometimes we speak of the church as, as Jesus's body. And he writes in verse 18, Jesus is the head of the body, the church, in the new uh, creation. And so as, you, as you're here this morning, you might, you, you might live and breathe now, but one day you'll die like Jesus. But you'll come back to life and you'll receive a new body like Jesus and live in that new creation where Jesus rules. And so if you're trusting Jesus, you don't need to do it. Yes, you'll die like Jesus, but you'll come back to life again. And, and you'll receive a new creation body. And it will be amazing. And just, just the, the important thing to note there is that in this creation and in the creation to come, you'll have different bodies, but you'll have the same ruler. King Jesus will be there. King Jesus will be ruling that creation there as he's ruling this creation now. He'll be the boss there, and he is the boss now. And so as we journey to that new creation, we must remember how we're approaching him now. How are we thinking about it now? Because he's going to be there. He'll be ruling and reigning there. And Paul, and Paul says that Jesus rules this creation, and he rules the creation to come. And so he has the supremacy. He is number one, verse 18. And so Paul says the Colossians are going good with it. But in some way, they were thinking they don't need Jesus as much. They were losing their vision of Jesus. And so Paul reminds them, they cannot get to God. They can't see God without Jesus. At the start of the poem, Paul says, if you want to see God, then you must look at Jesus. He's the image of God. And in him, we see his compassion, his kindness, God's compassion, God's kindness. And his love. But here towards Paul says, if Paul says, just look at verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. That in Jesus, God dwells, God lives in Jesus. And so that's a great privilege as Christians that as we go to Jesus, as we pray to Jesus. We're speaking to God living among us and living uh, in us. In the Old Testament, the, God's people, they, they built a tent that they might meet with God. And they built a temple that they might meet with God. But God never lived in that building. He never lived in the temple. He would come down and he'd meet with them in the tent. And then he'd go up to heaven again. He wasn't there dwelling, living uh, among them. And likewise, we might do all sorts of things to, to meet Jesus. We might climb a mountain, we might climb Pender Hill and, and think we're close to God there. We might uh, make church feel special and dim and feel like a temple back in those days. We might uh, look at science and try to discover God in the molecules. Uh, we might try to live our lives free of inhibitions and try to find God in that way. We might do all sorts of meditations, rituals, wanky. Buddhist to meet God. But all of those are foolish because verse 19, Paul says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell, live in Jesus. And so if you want to meet God, then you must go to Jesus. You must go uh, to Jesus. But if we get Jesus wrong, then we get God wrong. Let's just think, before we move through to our final point, let's just try and apply, apply that briefly. So in these verses, Jesus is described as our creator and that we are our creatures. And we sung that he is a holy God. He's different to us. He's, he's God our creator. And so the categories that we approach him with, that we think about him with, are different. We can't approach Jesus like our our friend. We can't treat him like our friend. 
I might see him if I want to. He is our God. He's our creator. He's distinct and different. When we think about sin, sometimes we think of sin as the naughty things I do, the thing I do. But if we understand who Jesus is, then we realize that sin that the thing that makes sin so bad is that it's done against Jesus, our creator. It's done against someone who is so beautiful, so majestic, so glorious. That's the thing that makes sin so bad. And then uh, finally, uh, Jesus is our creator, but not saying that he created evil things, but rather his good creation rejected him, uh, and so it became evil. And so Paul, in these verses, he tells us who Jesus is, that he's the fullness of God, that Jesus rules over this creation, and he rules over the creation to come. And then finally, we see why he came. And that is, he came to bring peace, verse 20 to 23 there. So just look down at verse 21, and this might come as a bit of a shock to us. But he says to us there that once we were alienated from God, we were enemies in our minds because of our evil uh, behavior. And so Paul paints this picture of who Jesus is, how brilliant he is. And then he tells us how we have rejected him, how we have said no to him. And uh, I think when I, when I think through uh, my life, when I've, I've got things wrong and I've sinned, uh, normally the process is I, I, th I change what I think about Jesus a bit. I think, oh, he's not, he won't see what I'm doing there. And then a thought will come into my mind. And then that thought will become action. I don't know what, the, what it's like for you, but Paul says the answer is we need to see who Jesus is clearly, and that will guard our thoughts, will reform our minds, and that will protect us from doing bad things. And so the solution when we're sinning is not to stop doing the thing, but to see who Jesus is clearly, to find that he is someone who is worth worshiping, and he is glorious. But Paul says when we do fail, Jesus brings peace. He brings reconciliation between us and God. So just look down at verse 20. And through him, that's through Jesus, to reconcile himself to all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And then just look at verse 22. Paul finishes there. But now, God, he has reconciled you. He's brought peace to you through Christ, through Jesus' physical body, through death on the cross. And he's presented you holy in his sight, without blemish and free of accusation. And so Jesus, he goes to the cross and he dies a death that only he could die. He dies as God in our place. He takes the, the punishment that our sin deserved. And in response, he gives us a perfect life. He gives us a life free from blemish, free from accusation. Maybe you've, you've done something and it gnaws at you, gnaws at you in your, in your heart. You think, why did I do that? Why did you do, do that? And Paul in this letter says, he has Jesus died on the cross, his glorious death, a glorious God dying for us, so he leaves us free from accusation, bringing peace between us and God. And so Paul, uh, in conclusion, he encourages the, Col the Colossians that given who Jesus is and given what Jesus has come to do to bring peace, they need to continue in him. Verse 23, just look what he says. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. And it's easy to worship Jesus on Sunday at church. We've got a great band. Uh, John's leading us well. We hear some nice words. We've got a brew afterwards. But Monday morning at work, it might get a bit harder. The lads might start giving us sticks. 
The ladies might look down on us. They might be speaking about what they've been doing on the weekend. And we've been thinking that might sound a bit exciting. But Paul says to the Colossians, look to Jesus. Remember how awesome and glorious he is. Remember that in Jesus, God lives among you. You can speak to him as a man speaks to his neighbor face to face. Don't forget about that and continue in it. If you haven't met Jesus before, then in this passage, Paul is encouraging you to, to meet Jesus, to see who he is. If you have stepped back from Jesus, Paul is calling you to worship him again, to see him clearly. And if you're going well in Jesus, then Paul here is encouraging you to continue going well, to continue trusting Jesus more and more each day. Right, let's pray as we close this. So our Father, we pray that we would see Jesus clearly in this passage. We pray that we would see that he is an awesome creator, that he will rule the new creation. We thank you that he brings reconciliation, peace between us and God, that he is amazing and awesome. Please help us to love him more and more each day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.